Every year Animation Mentor releases a video, some of the work that has been done by the students of the school at various levels to celebrate what they've made while going to school. We get to talk to some of those animators. I've interviewed, I think, 10 or 11 different students who were at the school. Some of them are now alumni, some have jobs now, because it's great to get to hear from people who are veterans in the industry and have been working in animation for years and years and have tons of experiences and insights that they can share with us but we very rarely get to hear from the animators who are just getting started in the industry. This video is gonna be kind of a collection of the best moments, highlights, and different stuff that I felt would be really valuable to share, all edited into one super helpful video. Some of it is practical workflow advice, things they learned in the classes, some stuff about getting hired, getting jobs, so it's gonna be a really nice variety of advice. And if you end up going to Animation Mentor and signing up for classes, please tell them that you came from this video or that I sent you. I appreciate it. And with that, let's jump right in. Enjoy the Animation Mentor Student Showcase interviews. So the funny story about that audio is my parents are like support systems. So like when I was going through AM, they were like, we'll help you find audio for class six. Like let's this final push. Oh. My dad's the one that found the audio. It's like Anne Hathaway from a TV show called Modern Love. You wanna know who I am? Here's who I am. I'm in a supermarket looking for some peaches, like a craving for peaches. So I didn't see the audio. He's like, do you want to see the clip? I was like, no. So like I specifically refrained from seeing what the actual clip was. I had Sean Sexton for class six as my mentor and Ooh. his whole thing. Yeah, Sean, we love Sean. Okay, everyone, you've gotten to the point where you can animate. Now you need to differentiate yourself from everyone else. Well, I was trying to find any audio, you know, brainstorm the first dumb ideas that came out, you know, your first ideas, like never good. Say, oh, I could have her like in a supermarket, like being crazy. Like I was in a supermarket looking for, and she's just telling the story maybe to someone else. But I was like, well, how dumb can you go with it? <laughs> I remember actually seeing a shot by, I think the animator, if she's at Pixar now, her name's Jennifer Megita. And she did a shot back in AM of, I'm sure you probably know what I'm talking yeah. about because Sean shows it. Yeah, it's like the interview and like she's being interviewed and she's, and they're like, what do you like to do for fun? And I was like, that would be a really fun kind of thing. Like, like have narration of one thing but show something crazy that's awesome that's such a i mean that's that's such a good way to like take inspiration but then make it your own and do something fun with it so i did uh, get the cartoony workshop i registered for it but i haven't thought of any idea yet and it i did go to this uh, famous temple in india and yeah they have this offerings where you kind of eat at the end of the you know visit of the temple and they, we throw them in the dustbin and this old guy was actually getting into that pushing it deep inside so that you can get more trash in it. And I thought, okay, that could be nice where I could have like a alleyway and you could just jump around and basically like not walk and do all this crazy stunts with the cartoony stuff. Like different ways one could put a trash in the trash can. And I came across this amazing piece of reference of this uh, girl swinging across a bouldering. Obviously I liked the action and I thought it'd be a good one to animate. I started to think about, well, how would you use this? When would you use it? If you had to do this action, what would motivate you to do it? There'd have to be a good real reason for you to want to sort of put yourself in danger in this way. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, let's put it in sort of a modern vernacular and uh, a contemporary setting. And um, and that was when I came up with the idea of uh, someone trying to get to work. And there was a series of incidents that sort of stopped them from getting to work. That's a fun little exercise. Like I have this action. What would it take for me to have to do this? <laughs> Once I had the original idea, my planning process mostly started with who is this character that wanted it to feel as genuine as possible. She's been working on this storyboard for like maybe two or three weeks and has been rejected each and every time. And she's probably like stayed up all night. This is like her final revision and it needs to be finalized. That's why there's coffee and everything everywhere. And then she's like, there's dragons. Are we please, are we really going to add this in? Because if we're not going to add this in, I'm going <laughs> to. Damn it. So my planning process was a little chaotic because it was classics, you know, and you have like your one week to kind of get all your planning done. And I'm a very reference heavy animator in terms of planning. So I can do it quick and get ideas out there and just be, what about this? What about that? My main process for any shot I do, but like this one specifically was she's kind of like doing double speak here where she's saying one thing but she's meaning something else right my whole thing was okay now i'm going to break down the subtext of like here's the line go in what is she actually thinking and then i would film different ref takes of 
you know, different acting choices based on what was she really saying? You know, I was in a supermarket looking for some peaches, like a craving. So maybe she's thinking, oh, I, I love stealing, right? <laughs> she's like a kleptomaniac. Yeah, so I did some tests. Bas basic uh, technical problem was how to use that trick. Do you draw a lot? Like, is that something no, that, that you're was like... I don't know how to draw. That was my actually first take on doing a 2D animatic and it turned out good. I spent a lot of time, but it was rough, but it sold the idea. Oh my God, I love yeah. the rotate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that was actually where I thought it was impossible to do it, but then I used Animbot, the temporary pivot, and it was so easy with that. That's where it got interesting. Obviously you had Sean Sexton as well. He very much prefers straight ahead, but I found class three in particular very difficult. Like you, you, do, the, you do the bouncing ball and then you do the, you do a, a, a few tests in class two and then you get to class three and it's like, oh, okay, okay. Maybe this isn't actually as easy as I thought it was. I swore I would never go straight ahead after class three. Oh God, it was terrible. In class four, I had Raymond Ross amazing mentor and pose to pose and that's the first time I really felt comfortable with animation was in class four so when I got to Sean he was like no you've got to go straight ahead and I was like I can't do this I don't know what to do <laughs> like <laughs> that was like mental breakdown moment because it's like I can't do it I can't do it I don't I don't know how to go straight ahead I don't know what to do but anyway I, I came out on the other side and it is now my favorite workflow straight ahead it is so quick. I cannot believe how quick it is. I don't know, everything just clicked. Sean Sexton and Straight Head changed my life. <laughs> That's great. So what changed for you between the first time you tackled Straight Ahead and, and was it just the experience of the other stuff in between? Yeah, I think it was experience and I was working full time as well as doing AM in class three and class four. I retook class four, not because I failed or I or I got um, like a bad grade. I just did it because I felt like I hadn't learned as much as I needed to learn to progress to be where I needed to be. Getting interested to acting is such a fundamental part if you don't get it right i think you're gonna really struggle moving forward i think that's really i mean that's really insightful that you recognize that so early on like i didn't think to do that i rushed through it as quick as i could because i thought for some reason that like mm -hmm. oh yeah just, just move through them and just oh i passed good enough go yeah i was not at all thinking about like i'm gonna yeah. suffer for that later so yeah that's brilliant drawing it out and making an animatic was really useful because I could really get the timing right beforehand. So I think that helps speed me up a lot because I was able to, instead of playing around with the poses and the timing in my, uh, I used Adobe Animate to just kind of like get the frames there. Cause I used to be a flash animator. So that I'm much faster in that in some ways. So just getting that all set up and then be like, okay, using this as my reference. Now I can pose where I know the frames are supposed to be and the timing is all there. So Sean's workflow is a little bit different. He doesn't like you to block in the face immediately. So you kind of like close the character's eyes and just block in the body. And the body is kind of like, if I remember correctly, like block in every eight frames. That's your own. And just like stay very close to the VRF. And so that's kind of like I did. For my first boss, I blocked like every eight frames. There's like a very long point blocking. Then you break it down like every four frames and every two frames. And that's like the first boss for blocking. And then like you just continue like breaking up, breaking up. And then after a while, you start to switch it to spline. And I think it's not Sean Sexton it'll be, but your blocking shouldn't be much different from the spline. So if you hit the spline button, it should look the same. And then you block in the face and hope for the best. I really liked what I learned in class three with Drew, Drew Adams. And his approach is going um, straight ahead with it. So that resonates with me a lot. It gives me the, the creative liberty to figure out what's going to happen next, even though I have reference. So I, I do stick to reference at the beginning just to get it all in roughly. And then I do another pass. It was basically just like the whole thing animated on, uh, on twos. I was really focused on getting the performance. So I, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, preoccupied about the like, yeah, curves or, or all that stuff. I just, I just wanted, you know, feedback on performance, feedback on how, how to push it more and all of that. So one thing I do have a trick for the button the mechanics part i usually when i shoot reference and want to get the most out of it i just you know put it in an after effects and then do a little bit of editing like time warping and do all of that just to get the spiciness coming from games i learned that uh, motion capture just looks awkward uh so if you sort of preserve the same timing as your body 
it will have like a weird type of visual effect that I don't want to achieve in my animation. So I usually speed things up that I learned from motion capture. Like you speed things up a bit, like 30 to 10% so that it looks more stylized. I use pretty much every workflow in the book for this shot. Sean Sexton like has a very structured way he likes you to do it. So I did that, like where he does, you know, key down on tubes, basically take your reference, get it into Maya then do the fun stuff later. My workflow's changed a lot. It's weird to think back like a year ago because I've changed a lot as an animator in terms of like what my workflow is, like what I did back then. Thinking now, I'm like, oh, like it hurts me. <laughs> it physically pains me. Um, I, I was a very scared animator back then. I would just key everything down and be like, okay, Sean said it's good, I'm gonna leave it. I was like, don't touch it. But um, now I have a very like spline heavy workflow. I get my base poses in and then I just spline. Like I immediately get into there. I get my, you know, maybe depends on how long the shot is, but five to 10 poses. And then I go in and just start splining like crazy and just making sure that the movement works, which is very different and would have probably given me a heart attack back a year ago. <laughs> the way I'd originally sort of structured it, there were three um, shots. First shot, she gets she gets across the bridge because of the, the road works. She gets on her bike and then drives down the road. And the idea there was a piece of paper was gonna flap into her face and that she would uh, swerve and then hit these roadworks, which would scoop her up into the air. And then she would fly through in the, in the last shot, she would fly through the window uh, and land inside the office. In the process of working the first shot, together with Michael Amos's um, sort of uh, guidance, we decided that uh, it'd be better for me to um, spend my time polishing, working the first shot because it was such a good, interesting shot to do to work that. Really simple, it sounds like it got really simplified, but it ended up working out really well. <laughs> yeah, well, the very first draft of it was too long. I had too many poses and too many things going on. And uh, the part at the end where he crashes and backflips around, it almost looked like he was doing that on purpose, like he was part of his performance. So we changed uh, the, the way he grabs the board in the air and we changed uh, the way he uh, goes into the double backflip so that it's much more out of control and you can tell he's not doing it on purpose. He's kind of going along for the ride and hoping not to die. <laughs> yeah. And Polish actually changed a big part of it. There's this moment where he kicks the boot and he does like a boom and kicks the boot, yeah. I didn't like the way it ended up, ran it by Sean. And initially it had a one beat, but the song had two beats in it, so I just redid that whole bit, uh, bit and just added another hop in it mm. to kick. So that was something that I majorly changed in Polish. I don't know, because usually people just, when they get to Polish, they, should, they change little things. I just wanted to mention that, you know, it's from my point of view, it's okay if you get to change bigger things as well, as long as, you know, they make the shot better. It, it didn't involve that much at all because I, always known what I wanted to do. Like I, I had the audio for ages, like I always knew I was going to use Galifant. I knew that it was going to be some sort of medieval sort of eerie sort of thing and then I was really really lucky. Um, like I showed Sean my first reference pass for this and he was like yep love it, go with it. Um, just refilm reference for this, this and this and then he was like good to go, get it blocked out. So I was really really happy with, with that because <laughs> he's like signed off my idea straight away. <laughs> One thing I I changed from the beginning, he was uh, yelling at her saying, uh, you can't come home and more more stressed. In the third week, I, I push down this character and I do it like strict character and quiet and self-confident. Uh, you can't you can't go to your home. And the, and the girl is more shy and insecure, right? And this helped me to to change at the end because the uh, the guy at the end uh, became more insecure. Uh, what is happening? And, and the girl, self-confident and, uh, bye, <laughs> see you there. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, was pretty fun, this, this this change of roles, right? That's that's a really cool evolution because you, you went from presumably something that was a little bit more flat to now both characters yeah, actually get to have a change. Um, my mentor, he didn't think I should do more than two persons. He, like he said, just focus on one character. But I still wanted it to be in somewhere in the animation industry. And so I was talking to some friends, like a meeting, and we were shooting out ideas. And then 
we came up with like oh what if she's a storyboard artist and then after that we came with the joke of like having the b-movie storyboards and i was like that's the whole reason why i'm doing this right now <laughs> the thing that i find like most important like feedback that i got was you use the reference as reference but then when you get to certain parts where the reference can no longer help you you need to think creatively and find solutions and test out you know solutions for what you need to do was what Michaels uh, made me do. He said, well, just, just concentrate on 50 frames. You know, isolate the 50, yeah, the first 50 frames, work through the critiques. And obviously I had my action list so that I could do that. And it was just taking a, a small section at a time and, and working your way through. I tried, I suppose it's just like burying your head in the sand. You don't think about all the other, all <laughs> the rest of it. You know, you just, just concentrate on this little bit, having blinkers on. And, and you, you, know, you take care of the next bit a little bit later. I had a particular note from one particular person. They'll probably know who they are when I say it. They said to me, Poppy, you need to learn to be happy doing less movement. Less is so much more. You need to stop drifting between your poses and just live and breathe in that pose because if you have a good pose that's solid enough and you don't need to constantly move and turn and shake and gesture you just need to figure out your timing and your texture and it'll be good just stop doing things <laughs> <laughs> i feel like that's one of the really hard things is when you're i mean really through all of am um, I feel like that's a lot of people struggle with. You have a pose, then you have another pose, and then what do you do in between? You just yeah. Like, just like tween machine drift it? Like, <laughs> not necessarily. But. So it's, it was kind of the same thing of how I was animating of like, okay, I'm just going to change a little bit here and a little. And then I do that throughout my whole shot, and nothing really felt like it changed or got better until I kind of came to that approach of like, okay, don't animate scared. Delete this whole curve if you need to, and just like redo it. Like, and once I started doing that, I got faster, which I thought it would make me slower because it seems like more work, but you're actually doing more work, but creating way less work for yourself in the long run and less iterations because you start to get what you want quicker. Don't animate scared, delete things if you need to. Animate confident in how you're animating and don't second guess your animation. Whenever I put work and effort in a shot and I look at it and I say, oh yeah, this is okay. I need to take a step back, take a little break, come back, flip it maybe, and then watch it and say, oh no, it can be pushed further. So it always can be pushed further, at least in my case. You know, some people, you know, go too much and they need to bring it down. I'm the kind of person that, you know, I, I go like, and I can push it up. Not animating the face. That's like one of the biggest ones. Like just focus on the body, don't focus on the face. And that like biggest tip was, your face animation, you do not need a copy of a reference. Like the face it needs to look appealing. And that's like the biggest thing I learned from Sean. Like I looked at my previous works and I always like copied the reference for XYZ of the face and it looked horrible. That's like this one shot that like, as like, I cringe when I see it. It's like, this is horrible. And then when I asked Sean, he told us like, don't copy of your reference for your facial expressions. And I'm like, this is amazing. And suddenly I can like pose, which is great. So it was more about getting the subtleties of the mechanics and stuff on the reference, yes. but the face is its own thing to push mm, yes. and make interesting. This was finally the time I buckled down and learned constraints properly <laughs> because I went through all of AM just kind of like faking it with my constraints, which is bad, don't do that. <laughs> um, learn from my mistakes. <laughs> so the shot, and I had to, cause she was like holding on to different things and I had lots of space switching with like her IK hands, switching from FK to IK. Like I had never done that much technical things in one shot and dealing with all kinds of gimbal issues because she was like going down and like falling off a rope and you know, showing up back behind somewhere. So my cog rotations were an absolute mess. Like, and I learned a lot technically from the shot because it was kind of <laughs> the most technical shot I've done just in terms of like, there was a lot going on. To use the grease pencil tool in Maya. So you can kind of push your poses right by drawing inside of Maya. And the earlier draft that I sent you, you can see there's actually a hand drawn section where he spins along the rail just to try to test that out. You can really push to your arcs and your, your, your line of action without having to spend all the time of posing it out. So I would definitely recommend that for cartoony animation. And you found Maya's grease pencil 
adequate for, for those uses? Uh, actually, I used a souped up version of Maya's Grease Pencil. There is a paid plugin called Blue Pencil 2, which I purchased, and it's got some additional features that Maya's Grease Pencil doesn't have including layers. So at one point I had a layer for the skateboard and another one for the character and I could turn them on and off. I would recommend it. It was so awesome like saying, oh my goodness, it's awesome. I love it because I never had any of my stuff lit before. So it's like, this is amazing. I want like, I showed it to everyone. It's like sitting, it's like, just watch it. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. <laughs> Most people worked on the shot, but didn't light it, didn't render it. And so when they saw it like this, it was like a shock. They're like, oh my gosh, it looks so good. You actually did all this yourself. Is this is the version you made the version that's in the showcase? They added extra sounds. So they did the the tippy tappy toes. They did the the cat sound. Yeah, but other than that, it's what I did. Is that something you had experience? Like you mentioned, you had learned a lot of that for this. Is that right? Like you hadn't really done much of that before. Actually, I started out watching your video on how to get lighting in Maya. Oh, and then I just went crazy after that. <laughs> I learned I learned all that. I learned all that. Then I did like a bunch of other research. The first thing that I put on AM was a, a nicely lit shot. Like last year's showcase I had my shot with the well, I don't know, the pizza guy and I lit it all up nicely in my and I was so proud of it. And that eventually uh, I turned to Blender because Blender's faster. And so I had, you know, an idea about what things should look like but I just learned as I was going. So with this uh, with this shot, with I'm in hell, I, I was learning as I was going. The one thing when I started AM, it, my goal was to get in that showcase. I was gonna work my bottom off to get in that showcase. And it wasn't so much seeing, oh, like I loved it. Like seeing it lit and rendered was amazing. Like it was, it's like the icing on the cake. It's just, it was, it's beautiful. I, they've done such a good job. So thank you. I still don't know who lit it. Whoever you are, please let me know because I, it's amazing. And I want to say thank you ever so much because you've made it look beautiful, gorgeous. It was seeing my name for the first time in lights. Like I, I haven't had that before and hopefully it will be the first credit of many. <laughs> like that's what really, that, that's what really touched me. That's awesome. And I, I mean, based on the quality of the work, I'm sure it's the first of many. Yeah, that was really cool. And I kind of have a weird place in the showcase where I actually had seen my shot lit and rendered like months, almost a year <laughs> before the showcase came out. Like, because right after, um, Animation Mentor, I graduated, I ended up talking and meeting with an extremely talented lighting artist named Diana Lee. And she was like, hey, I want to like test lighting your shot. Would that be cool? Can I test render? I'm like, absolutely. I was like, go for it. And I was still polishing at that time. So I was like, hey, can I polish this up first? Because uh, my my last classic submission versus my polished pizza shot don't look like the same shot <laughs> because there was a, a lot of polishing that went into that. So I was like, can we wait until I polish? She's like, sure. So I got to work with her for um, a few months on like being able to see it. And what was cool is she would give me a note of like, hey, the eyes look a little weird here because of like, I'm adding reflections now. So you can actually see some eye direction look like she's like cross-eyed. <laughs> so I was like, can you fix that? So I'd go fix that and go back and forth with her. That's awesome. That's so cool you got to actually kind of work with the lighter. That was a big surprise. <laughs> so it was, was, was amazing. Yeah, I think everyone thinks the same. So this is this is my shot, really, because <laughs> it's, it's completely different. It's, it's much much better. And you realize all the people that is working after you. You do your job, and that's it. But you think about the the lighting, the the texturing, the VFX, the sound. All these people makes your work much, much, much better. So I'm very grateful to to them and and, and to have this, this really, really nice shot. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of it just being a piece of body mechanics, I wanted it to have some kind of um, rhythm to it. When she originally comes down the stairs, it's obviously that quick, quick, slow bit where she like, comes down the stairs, jumps on, and then you got this slightly slower rhythm of her swinging across. And then the quick, quick, slow bit where she jumps into the office space. So I wanted to get that kind of beat going. There's one technique I used that you see a lot in cartoony animation when you frame by frame it, is uh, when he actually lands on the rail, I have a double of him. So there's two rigs in there. So it's kind of like a smear frame where you see him like this and him like that. So uh, that was a fun technique to try. 
one thing I really wanted to tackle was body mechanics, I guess. And I guess the whole point of like the standing still parts, like I really wanted to master that because I knew that like in my previous shots in AM, like I think that was one of my biggest struggles was the body mechanics and like keeping things still and alive for a certain amount of time. So when I kept getting those notes like, oh, you got to keep it still, keep it still. I was like, I know. <laughs> just like learning how to like get the curves to like just right so that it's moving, but it doesn't look like it's moving all that much. The sculpting part, I had to sculpt each and like at least at times where like 10 frames each pose I had to go in there and sculpt it slowly and make it make sure that it has that shape. So I used to have another mesh which would be in that shape and match it, sculpt, sculpt it slowly so that it matches that. Interesting. So like yeah. when you wanted him to like be in a circle, would you like put a sphere yeah. there? Yeah, I, I, sphere, I put a sphere there, I up the transparency and I kind of get that. I got, I got the shape slowly using sculpt tools. Ah, oh, that's smart. The feet. She was, mm. She's wearing high heels and I didn't set up the high heels, set a pivot on the heel which is like like the era before, so the heel would like slip. So I had to go frame by frame and animate high heels. I'm never doing that again. <laughs> the mirror, the mirror experience, because he's looking in the mirror and you don't have a mirror in, in my... Uh, I had to set up a camera over the shoulder camera that becomes like the uh, close-up camera and then I had a camera in place of the mirror and then I, I had to put a mirror geometry with a, like a, a green screen just so I can comp it like in After Effects later on and that was a pain because I was how do you make a performance that has to look good from two angles at once was there anything that you found easier than you expected? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was it was as, 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 as hard as I expected it to be. There's a, a feature on the rigs which allow you to pin the elbow and the knees mm -hmm. to a, a specific locator. And that did help because at one point I was going backwards and forwards trying to um, get out elbow pops and knee pops. I think it was Michael that suggested that obviously within the rig you've got this feature. Yeah, if you activate it, you can then polish out and make sure that those elbows and those knees are you know, nicely following arcs. And that, that was a big um, improvement. I've never heard anyone say that use for those controls. That, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> easier than <laughs> that's like, a great mm. question um no <laughs> me starting from ground zero as an animator of like i literally started the maya um workshop at am and that was the first time i'd done anything i didn't know what a rig was so i am very much like the am poster child in terms of like starting from like nothing and actually kind of knowing how to animate by the end of it and um that was classics is a cool time because i feel like with me that was the first time i was like okay, I have a workflow, I get this. And like, I didn't feel completely just like I was thrown overboard, <laughs> like going into a shot, like I had every other time because it was just like very overwhelming all at once. And I think that's something that AM does really well is taking students from zero to actually not feeling overwhelmed in a shot. And like, you still do. There are still times that I get technical shots that I'm like, I don't know how to animate and I get scared. I'm like, what was it two years of nothing? Like I just get like completely like I can't animate anymore. Class six was the first class that I started a shot and I didn't feel completely overwhelmed. That's, I feel like that's the moment everything unlocks and you're like, oh, this doesn't yeah. suck. This is good. I'm glad yeah. I've been doing this for two years. <laughs> exactly. I was like, hey, I actually might be able to do this as a career. Whoa, no way. <laughs> there is something that I that I did to make things a little simpler for me. If you've ever animated a shot where you've got the camera and the character moving very fast through the scene, it can be a little bit of a pain because you're constantly moving your perspective camera around every time you're changing different poses. So I did a big cheat on this one. They're actually at the origin the whole time and the background is moving backwards. So I didn't have to deal with the constantly moving perspective camera. I have literally sat in my bedroom in the same place for two years. And I think mentally it's quite, it's quite difficult because I, like, I, I haven't been 
like meeting with people or you know going to work so I didn't have like the social aspect of it I was literally just by myself all day every day and one thing I would say is making friends or like animation friends is so critical to staying sane <laughs> <laughs> class one to four I didn't go to dailies <clears throat> and then when I start when I retook class four so class four to six I was in dailies four times a week. I was getting extra feedback. Somebody was like tutoring me on the side of AM as well. These people that you meet now, you're gonna be with them for the rest of your life. They will they will hold you up and they will give you feedback and they will they they understand. Not a lot of people understand what it's like to be an animator. Make animation friends because they will save your bacon <laughs> and help you get jobs. <laughs> that, yes, that is true. <laughs> I, I I only have a job because my friend works at Axis. <laughs> it's that mix between like, it's nice to know someone, but you have to be ready if they happen to find something for you. Yeah, exactly. That, that perfect blend. I definitely got really shot blind on this, on my pizza shot is because, you know, you're spending so much. I had the very thankful ability to be able to just be full-time student when I was in AM. Um, I wasn't working at the time. And so I was just spending probably a good, you know, 18 hours a day animating at my computer. So you get very shot blind because of that. And so I, especially when I got to like splining, cause I was also wasn't super confident in my splining skills at the time and that it needed a lot of work. So I would just look at it and I would get really frustrated. Cause I was like, I can't, I know there's issues, but I don't know how to fix them. Like, and so that's when it is so important to like rely on friends and peers and mentors to be able to show them and be like, help, <laughs> help, <laughs> please. So being able to give them that and get like a fresh pair of eyes on your shot and someone to walk you through. If anyone's in that point in their animation skill career right now, it gets better. <laughs> Just, you gotta work <laughs> through it. So, and it will come and go. You, It will not be the last time you feel that way. So <laughs> yeah. it's just one of those ebbs and flows of life. In the third shot, there's, there's he does a hand flourish as he's dancing around. And it was a complete happy accident. Like I didn't realize I had done it until I had done it. <laughs> and I'm really proud of it because it looks so good. <laughs> but no one else will see it. <laughs> Only I will see it. Um, that, so, that's gotta yeah. be the, I mean, that's the best feeling when you're like, you're like, oh wait, what's that? Oh, I didn't, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna touch that. Yeah. I feel like it's very like, just like proud of the whole thing. I'm like, I did that. It's, it's rendered and that's like kind of my reaction. Like I'm like proud of it overall. So it's finished. It's like I love the lip sync. I love the facial stuff. So it's like like that's that's my baby, and I'm proud of it. The one thing that I really had fun with, and I hesitate to even call it a smear because it's not really, it's not that bush. But like when she falls off of the um uh, rope, like I did a lots of fun like smear frames with like her head, and, like kind of making like her eyes. Like I actually went in and like used a JS Anim polish and like sculpted everything, <laughs> like sculpted her head and like did new poses and like shapes for it. So that was a fun thing that like I had never done before. And I was like, I'm an artist. Whoa! Like I was so like happy with that because I was like, this is so fun. It's not just technical gimbal lock issues. I was like, I'm actually having fun with it. So. Well, my next question was going to be what's next for you, but I feel like working at Pixar is a pretty good like next step, I guess. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's As... kind of like when I like got an internship at Pixar, like that a week before, I did a PowerPoint presentation for my whole family, like planning out my year. And I was going to do this and this, and then I'm going to get a job here and here. And then like, and, like the next week, Pixar was like, hey, do you want to do the internship? I'm like, OK, and like, <laughs> I, I don't have any plans out for that. <laughs> So they called you. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I applied to internship, but like, I think in, like in the beginning of the year and then like the middle of the year, like they just like send me an email. It's like, hey, can I have like a phone call with you? I'm like, okay, let's do a phone call. Like, I'll have and to check like, my Don't. calendar, Pixar. I mean, I started in, uh, uh, in December at Illumination McGuff. So on the way. <laughs> that's yeah, yeah. That's Congrats. that's next for me. How long ago was this shot? Like, was this shot part of your reel when when you applied there? Oh yeah, actually this this shot was opened a few doors for me. So I finished this shot in February uh, this year, 2021. And 
I think this shot helped me get the gig at uh, Cinecide. I worked on Adam's Family 2 and uh, the current gig that I had uh, working at Axis. So it, it was very good, you know, in terms of getting me through the door. And actually, I, I think it helped with the illumination as well because, you know, they reached out. I mean, I, I didn't apply, I, I wasn't, so they reached out. So I think it's because of, you know, the student work. That's awesome, congratulations. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like and leave any comments down below that you'd like to share of things you would you really enjoyed, you'd like to see more of, and so on. A huge thank you to everyone who participated in this video. Wouldn't have been possible without you, obviously. And a huge thank you to Animation Mentor for helping me actually set all of this up. There's a link to Animation Mentor in the description, so if you wanna check them out, you can go there. And remember that if you sign up for classes, please let them know that you came from this video or that you came from my channel in general. I appreciate it. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next video.